the channel. I am Soph, one half of Becca and Soph, and today I'm here to tell you all about what paralegals do. So let's start off with the obvious question, what is a paralegal? So in my opinion, this is the stage before you become a trainee solicitor. You might have just graduated from university or perhaps you haven't even been to uni, but it's kind of like the initial stage into the company. You're definitely at the bottom of the food chain, but it's really good in my opinion that you get to learn the basics of how the company is run and how all of the more admin tasks are done. Because then when you progress throughout the company and you ask your junior to do something, you'll kind of know the process that they have to go through. And it just gives you a really good understanding of the law firm that you are working for. Different law firms have different names for paralegals. So in my company, there are no paralegals. They are called legal assistants. Um, in other companies, they are just paralegals. And I'm sure there are many other names out there. But essentially, if you are an assistant or a paralegal, you all do the same thing. And you are, as I said, kind of at the bottom of the food chain. Now on to what paralegals do. This is a very lawyer-like answer, but it depends. <laughs> so it depends on the law firm that you work for. It also depends on the team that you are in. I've heard of a lot of paralegals who purely do kind of secretary style tasks. And I've heard of a number of others who really hit the ground running. And within a few months, they're doing more trainee solicitor style tasks. So as I said, it really depends, but I'll talk you through the different stages of what you could be doing if you are a paralegal. So if you are a paralegal and you're doing more of the secretarial roles, you will be doing things like opening a file. So when you take on a new client, a file has to be opened on the database for them and you will be in charge of opening that file, doing all the compliance checks, liaising with the potential new client to ask questions like, what's their address and who do we send invoices to, etc. So you can open files, of course, when the work is done, you can close files. Before you can close files, you have to charge the client for the work done, so you can be sorting the invoicing. And then there's a number of other different admin tasks like calling up the client to arrange a meeting, indeed arranging the meetings, just doing things that people who are paid lawyers don't have the time to do like you pick up the smaller bits if that makes sense if you are lucky enough to be a bit like me you will be in a team and a law firm who really wants to see you grow so whilst you start with those really basic tasks you are then asked and required to do more things as well as those tasks so of course i still have to open files and close files and bill but i can do those a lot quicker now i probably used to take four times as long just because I was a nervous new starter. Now that I can do those really quickly, that for example could be an, an evening task, like at the end of the day sort of task or first thing in the morning. And then what the law firm have encouraged me to do is actually get stuck into more legal work. And I think that's really exciting when they can trust you and give you the responsibility of a trainee solicitor without you being at that stage yet. So the type of tasks that you will do as a paralegal if you are given legal work will be quite different depending on what team you're in. So I'll just talk from my perspective because of course that's all that I can do. So I'm in the employment law department and for me as a paralegal or legal assistant in my firm, the type of things that I do are take new inquiry calls. So when these new um, potential customers call, they'll say, we've got this legal problem. This is the way that we intend to pay your legal fees. Um, these are the deadlines that we've been set by the employment tribunal, for example, or this is the advice that we require. Do you think it's possible? And I take down all those details. I kind of have a flow chart to go through. And then if I can, I can initially assess whether my company can take on the work. Um, reasons that we couldn't, for example, could be if the potential new client is asking for a no win, no fee arrangement. Um, so my company don't do those. We need to be paid for the work that we do. We don't offer those sort of things. So obviously, if a client comes on and asks that, I say, no, sorry, but you can go here and here who offer that sort of arrangement for you. Um, another thing that I can kind of shut down if I need to is if a client calls up and says, I've only got X amount to spend, but I need you to do 
this sort of work is that possible and I mean in my team there are two partners and an associate and I know their charge out rates and if it isn't possible for them for example to look through a settlement agreement at the char at the price that they're asking for I have to kindly decline so I'm kind of like a filter and then equally I have the responsibility of taking all the new inquiry calls for employment around the nation so um, my company, I was about to say the name, my company have a number of different offices around um, England. I think we have 12 or 13. So if a client calls and said, actually, I'm based in Manchester, then it's only fair that we give that work to the Manchester office. So as well as doing the filtering as to what sort of work my company can take on, I also do the signposting like you can go to the Manchester team, you can go to the Liverpool team, etc. So that covers new inquiries and just to put it into perspective, I probably get two or three a week. So that absolutely is not one of the main tasks that I have, but it certainly is something that I'm given the responsibility of doing. Um, at first, my partners, like they did it at first when I first joined. And then once I became a bit more confident and understood the process, they were like, are you ready to take the new inquiry calls? And I said, yes. And now I do them happily. Um, it's quite nice, actually. So I'm obviously not trained yet to give legal advice. So really, it's just a conversation. And I make that clear at the beginning. And then really, it's just a chat. And I take the information needed. To me, it's interesting to hear the legal problems that they have. And I think it's really good exposure to actual actual work and actual client queries and then what's really rewarding is bringing on that client setting up the file for them doing the more legal assistant tasks along the way and then billing them and then saying goodbye and they're like thanks for all of your help um to the whole team i think that's just really rewarding to see it from beginning to end and you can contribute to every single stage of that so as i said i can just talk about my time in employment law so i would say one of my main legal assistant or paralegal tasks is helping my team to prepare for employment tribunal hearings um most of our work is litigious which means there's some litigation involved, there's disputes, etc. And it tends to go all the way to the final hearing, which is heard at an employment tribunal. So what I have to do is when the initial employment tribunal papers come in, there are some key dates and you have to record these key dates because you need to meet those deadlines. So say someone has brought a claim against your client, you have to respond on behalf of the client to the claim. So you have to like diarise for all these important dates, like date to respond, date of the preliminary hearing, date to put together the bundle, date to do the witness statements and date of the final hearing. So first of all, you diarise all of those in the key dates diary and then you just get to work. So quite often now I will fill in the response form um, and the lawyer will check it and then whether it's a complex case or not, depends on whether I help them with the grounds of resistance. So you tend to submit an ET3, which is the response form, along with the grounds of resistance. So why you are resisting that claim. And as I said, if it's quite a simple case, or if we need to ask for what's called further and better particulars, so like more information, I am now given the responsibility sometimes of writing that, which is really exciting because it's sent to the employment tribunal and it's something that an employment judge reads. And obviously, that's quite daunting at my stage, but it's really exciting. And it gets the approval from your partners before it gets sent off. So it's all fine. So after you've responded, you need to kind of work towards the final hearing. But along the way, you might consider settling. So pulling together a settlement agreement between your client, which in my case tends to be the company, and then their client, which tends to be the individual who brought a claim against the company. The settlement discussions can happen through a judicial mediation or just conversations between the solicitors and letters sent back and forth to try and work out a middle ground, a figure that you're happy to settle on. And then you just fill in the settlement agreement. And once you've both agreed it, you all sign it. And it's kind of like settled out of court. If you've heard that before, like it never makes it to the final hearing. There's no need to go through the process. You're both happy with the settlement figure and the employees kind of paid off. In terms of what a paralegal does, it could be that before you, for example, exchange witness statements, you want to try and settle it again. And say, for example, the partner in my team has 
sent over a settlement offer but has had no response it might be that i have to call up the other side the solicitors and be like look have you received this email we want to try and settle it can you get back to us asap um so my team are quite happy for me to reach out to the other side and have some of those conversations if you haven't managed to settle it before it gets to final hearing there are two main things to do which i've mentioned before so one is to prepare the bundle and the other is to prepare the witness statements now the first bundle i ever had to do was over 4,000 pages and that is a very huge bundle i was very overwhelmed it was very stressful but the partner kindly guided me through it and the client was really nice um, and over time we pulled it together and it was a really successful bundle. So what is a bundle? Well, a bundle is a giant or many giant ring binders with all of the relevant documentation. So the first part of it, we tend to call it section A, is the pleadings. So what the case is about and all of the correspondence with the tribunal. That's in section A. Then section B are all of the emails, letters, messages, everything, pay slips, everything necessary and relevant to the case is in that bundle. So I personally have to put it in the chronological order. I have to create an index for the bundle and then you do what's called paginate the bundle, which is lovely online because it's just one click um, and it gives all the numbers, page numbers. But then of course you have to go into the index and say, well, email, from this person to this person is page 949 to 950, for example. So imagine how overwhelmed I was doing that with a 4,000 plus page bundle. It was very overwhelming, but very rewarding. And then the final thing that you have to do as a legal assistant when preparing for an employment tribunal case is help with the witness statements. So if we go back to that first ever bundle that I had to do, after I finished the bundle, the barrister and the solicitor, so the partner in my team, decided how many witnesses we needed. And I think it was something like 16. So our client said, oh, we'll take eight and, and we'll do eight. Um, the client took like the easier ones that were easy to pull together and we took the more complex ones. So myself and the partner had to have Teams calls or Skype calls with each witness, interview them for about two to three hours it tended to be. I would take notes along the way and then I would put together a first draft of a witness statement. And what a witness statement is, is who they are, what role they had in the company, and basically loads of evidence to like defend us kind of thing. If you want to put it in like criminal way, it's like they're defending our client. So they could be, for example, the HR professional who dealt with the grievance. And we just like list all the facts, everything that they knew about the situation. Um, they read it, we kind of go back and forth to change bits if it don't, doesn't make sense or if they're not happy with them and then they sign it and that's one, that's one witness statement done. So we had to pull together 16 of those. <laughs> um, so that's essentially the prep for an employment tribunal case and as I said that is the litigious side of employment law and those are the type of responsibilities and tasks that I have to do. On the non-litigious side of employment law it's just when a company reaches out and says, hey, we've got someone who's going on maternity leave. Can we make her role redundant? Question mark. And all it is for us is a bit of legal research or if we know the answer already, we just write the advice. And obviously, because I'm not yet legally trained, I don't tend to get a lot of those um, tasks given to me unless they're fairly straightforward or unless it's something that I've shown interest in already. So with one example, without giving away too much detail, there were two people who were uh, both as equally qualified for the role, kind of have the same grades, have the same experience. Um, can The question was, can we use positive action to employ one of them over the other? Now, won't go into too much detail, but positive action is legal positive discrimination is illegal. So positive action is when everything is the same and only when you're at the final stage of choosing who should, who should get the role um, are you allowed to positively act and employ the person who is in like an underrepresented group. 
Because I do a lot of diversity and inclusion work within my company, my team know that that's something that I'm quite passionate about and interested in, especially when I can mix that and legal advice. So as I said, if they get a query and it's something that I'm interested in, they do allow me to go away, research it and produce a research note or a memo and they will read it, review it and amend it if needs be before sending it out. Hopefully that's a good summary of what a paralegal does. Just to recap, you can either be given really admin tasks or actually some good legal tasks. And I would say the majority tend to get a bit of both. Um, in terms of the admin tasks, file opening, file closing and billing. In terms of the legal tasks, as I said, it depends on what department you're in. In employment, you either do litigious tasks, so you work your way towards the employment tribunal hearing, or you do non-litigious tasks, which is giving advice to your clients. So I hope that's been helpful. I hope it hasn't been a whirlwind like it has seemed in my head. Um, and please let me know if you want to know anything more about being a paralegal. This is actually my final month of being a paralegal because in February I become a trainee solicitor. So get your questions in quick. Otherwise I'll have to do a what does a trainee solicitor do video, which I will probably do in a few months time. Um, thank you so much for watching. I really hope that you enjoyed it. Becca has done a what does a junior auditor do video. So I'll link that down below and you can go and listen to her talk about her role. Hope you've enjoyed it. Speak to you soon. Bye.